Welcome to the Bearded Tits podcast, the nature-based show hosted by me, Jack Perks. Each week I'm joined by a guest from the world of wildlife television, art and science. We take a light-hearted look into what makes these people tick and connect with the natural world so strongly, with new episodes out every Tuesday. This week I'm joined by naturalist and TV presenter Nick Baker, best known for appearing on The Really Wild Show, Weird Creatures and Spring Watch Unsprung to name a few. We talk about his passion for creepy crawlies, how wildlife presenting has changed over the years, and how he started his career in wildlife filmmaking. Also hang around till the end because I'll be announcing the next four or five podcasts, including what is going to be my biggest project ever, and letting you know the title of it and what it's going to be. Well, thanks for joining me, Nick. It's a pleasure, Jack. It's been a while. I know you've, uh, well, we've been talking about doing this for some time, haven't we? Yeah, I feel like I'm a, a, I'm a twitcher of, of wildlife personalities as I'm trying to contact all these people. And you've been like a, a rare migrant that I keep seeing, but we just can't quite twitch. But we've got there in the end. It's been a weird year like that. It's, it's strange. <laughs> it should be more accessible than ever before. But you've got to be feeling, you've got to be, you know, you've got to be winning. You've got to be swinging to, to want to do this. And, um, and it's kind of, it's been one of those years, it was great. At the beginning of lockdown, I felt completely released from all the pressures of, of um, freelance life. Not that I was making any money or getting any government help, but it's weird. I felt like a, I was like a 10 year old with a mortgage. You know, that's how it felt. And I was just going out and playing. And then of course, when it unlocked and everyone went back, that's when I started feeling a bit rubbish. And I sort of went, I got a bit down in the dumps, to be honest with you. And it's taken a while of continuous sort of whipping myself along and sort of things have started moving again now. So I'm in a good space. I'm actually not in a good space literally right now because I'm stuck in a, in a room in Japan in quarantine. Uh, I've got to do two weeks in an airport hotel before I, um, I'm released into the wild. So, um, but I'm, you know, it's a job and I'm really excited by that, you know, so it's a good place to be. Have you been to Japan before? I haven't. No, that's why it's know. proper exciting. It's, um, it's been one of those travel glitches. I've always wanted to come here. Quite a lot of what I'm into uh, comes from this neck of the woods. Um, mainly, I'm really into, I guess I'm on some kind of spectrum. I really like neat and tidy. I like little things of perfection. That's why I'm into insects. But Japan, of course, is famous for taking on board lots of like tri- Chinese traditions and, and owning them. So, you know, the, the idea of, um, you know, aquascaping, for example, the, the art of aquascaping, bonsai, passion for little things, uh, the minuti, the sort of miniaturization of things sort of goes well. And there's quite a lot of an underlying natural or certainly nature based culture here. Um, so the Shinto culture is very much throughout Japan. So I'm expecting to like an awful lot of it. Also bikes, they're really into bikes. And of course, that's my other passions. This place is full of, uh, you know, green infrastructure. Even here where I'm staying, which is, um, I think it's Tokyo's equivalent of Croydon, um, right by the <laughs> airport, airport hotel, really is pretty grey and grim. But there's people cycling everywhere. There's kind of pavements, wide pavements that are demarked clearly. You know, there's pavement, there's cyclists on one side, uh, pedestrians on the other, and they all sort of intermix. And no one gets cross with each other. It's sort of lovely. It's sort of like a utopia in that sense. I think I'm right in saying that the bullet trains in uh, in Japan are based off a of kingfisher's beak. I think that's oh, right, that isn't it? Is, that is right, yes. It's to do with the, um, it's to stop the, let's try and get this right. So when a kingfisher hits the water, um, it shouldn't be possible. There should be a big noise when it hits the water. And they were, and, it, and they don't have it. And that's because they've got a certain shape to the very tip of the bill, a little groove. Um, and they were having problems with the bullet train when it went through tunnels and things because it, it made, it was causing big noise, basically. So it was a very good idea, but it was very noisy. And then they worked out if they stole this idea from a kingfisher's beak, you'd lose the noise. And I believe that's the story. I, 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 I'm actually going on the bullet train in a couple of, well, in about a week and a half's time. So uh, we're going up to Fukushima from, uh, from Tokyo. So uh, uh, we're going to be catching the bullet train up there. So I'm quite excited by that as well. Yeah, so when you go through the tunnels, you've got to kind of get your ear hanging out and just see <laughs> how well how well it's, it's working. Big minnows up on the front. Yeah, <laughs> that's like, yeah, just dangling just to encourage it to go. Um, so you, you mentioned briefly there, but although you're a general naturalist, you certainly tend to lean towards creepy crawlies. So what is it about invertebrates that you find so fascinating? I think it's just what I said. They are they are their perfection, you know, that the way the body plates all come together, they're sort of engineering, you know, evolutionary engineering 
And also there's a lot of them, they're very accessible. And I suspect they were my first love really in many ways. Even though I was sort of into them, I, you know, I was aware of birds and things, I'm very short sighted and as a kid, I think it took a little while before that was diagnosed. So of course, you know, I couldn't see the birds at the end of the garden because they were blurry, but the, uh, <laughs> you know, the ants were right there and I could focus on them. So, um, um, so yeah, I think that's probably where it started. And, and also they underpin everything, you know, even, even your passion, you know, it all starts, you know, you can, you can get into your trout and your salmon, but then you, you really, the things they're eating or certainly the things they're feeding on are feeding on um, either when they're small or when they're, you know, they're feeding on other fish that predate, you know, caddis fly and, and mayfly and things like river fly uh, species. And of course they, they're everywhere. You know, you might not like the idea of invertebrates, the creepy crawlies, the mini beasts, call them what you like, but you certainly guaranteed will like, some of the things that I like them. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, yeah. the tension, the fun, there's something in it for us all, but, uh, but they are very important. And we're beginning to understand just how, well, beginning with entomologists have understood this for years, but of course uh, it's beginning to make the news now, you know, Buggermageddon, the, the massive decline of uh, insects, 80% decline in insects in some of the studies. Um, we know that moths and butterflies are declining. And of course, when we're losing those, uh, they're the visible ones. It's the invisible things, the things that make up the uh, the biomass, as it were. Um, when we're losing those, is it any wonder we're losing insectivorous birds and the fish numbers are down and bat numbers are down? And you know, it has a massive knock-on ripple effect throughout the ecosystem. So that cascade is all part of the energetics that I'm fascinated by. So there's lots of reasons: the characters, the the, the solutions to life, the the colours, the shapes, the um, uh, the morphology, all these things fascinate me about insects. I saw a, a great time lapse of that someone put some leaf litter in one tub and then they put leaf litter in with worms and wood lice and whatever. And within a couple of, it might not even be a couple of months, it might be a shorter time span, but the leaf litter was almost gone with the insects. But then without them, it just stays there and rots. And it just shows you, you might not see it with the naked eye in instant time, but they've got an important job. I mean, they've got lots of important jobs, but just one of just cleaning up nature's mess to a degree they're incredibly important aren't they that's right yeah, they're absolutely essential in, in that respect and they i mean you know but it's dead bodies dead leaves whatever it is they are they are part of that symphony of decomposition which um which we can't do without you know and it's it's what maintains our soils and ultimately what maintains the food that we grow in those soils so you know at every level these things are relevant and that's i guess it's sort of my i guess it's my life goal is to celebrate them and share them with as many people as I possibly can Definitely, I'm a you know yeah I'm a champion of the fish. I think it's a it's great to champion the underdogs because birds and mammals are are lovely, but they've got enough uh, enough people sh spouting about them. So let's yeah. Uh, well, I think that's what I like what, what, about what you do. You you take a subject and you look at it from a different angle, which is pretty much all all that you do when you're sharing the invertebrates with people. But I mean, I I like my fish as well, and I spend a lot of time bobbing around in rivers at the ridicule of my friends with a snorkel and just <laughs> watching. I mean, I, I used to fish, you know, I used to be an angler. My dad was, was a keen angler and I would shadow him um, down to the riverbank whenever I could. Um, it was good father son time. But the, uh, you know, I got my copy of Mr. Crabtree Goes Fishing, just like every other kid. And, um, and I enjoyed it until I learned to dive. Now, as soon as I learned to dive, I kind of put the rod down. Because really, the only reason I fished was to see the fish. I didn't want to eat them. And I didn't really like, you know, the whole fiddling around with a disgorger. It just felt so invasive. Um, um, and then I ended up, um, I kept a, a fish tank when I was a kid, it was full of coarse fish. So um, I was, again, I hate that word. Coarse sort of suggests they're not fine. And there's nothing yeah. fine than, a, than a, um, a, they always remind me of a silvery Burlington sock, the side of a gudgeon, you know, yeah. that lovely sort of silvery blue patterning on a gudgeon. Um, so I had a tank with gudgeon and roach and rud, um, and I, I sort of had it at the bottom of the garden because uh, I wasn't allowed fish in the house. I wasn't allowed any animals in the house, not after stick end set the gate. That was a disaster. Anyway, um, but I, I, I really, you know, I kept the fish there. And in fact, for a moment, the whole Mr. Crabtree goes fishing. For any of your um, podcast um, audience, it's a, it was a brilliant sort of, I guess it was an illustrated, almost like an illustrated novel between a, a bloke, a, a granddad and his grandson, I think, or was it a father and son? I can never work it out, but he was, he he was like his, yeah, they weren't related. I think he was just like, well, a not it'd probably be a bit dodgy in, in today's time, but at the time it was completely innocent and it was just yeah, like was a mentor. mentor of some form, yeah. yeah, he walked yeah. Like that and, and, pipe and, uh, and he would show how to read the water 
uh, and when you cast out what, what your float was doing and he related it to the fish underneath. So I did that. I actually would actually fish from my own fish tank. I'd sit there and watch the, what the fish were doing to my bait and my, my and the tackle under the surface and how it related to the... So I put the two together myself and that was quite interesting. But but to be honest with you, it's the fish I loved. You know, it's hunting for the fish. And as soon as I die, I learned to die, I, I could sort of cut out that sort of slightly uncomfortable process. And... Um, um, and, and swim with them. And, uh, and then you see, and as you well know, and that's why I love your work is because I relate to it because it reminds, I know, I know what you show. I know your photographs and um, I feel I know the fish. And to see that, to see someone who sees the world through that lens is really refreshing. And, uh, um, and that's, that, you know, that's why I love it. Definitely. I, I'm probably the same. I, I used to fish, a, I still fish a little bit now, but nowhere near as much as I used to. And it's, uh, if it's given the choice between putting the mask and snorkel on and picking up a rod, then there's no competition. It's, it's get the, the snorkel and, and, and get stuck into it. But I have actually dived in Dartmoor uh, in one of the big pools on the, is it the Tavi? The Tavi, is that the river in Dartmoor? Yeah, 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 and um, yeah, yeah, the there was a big salmon pool uh, behind a caravan park or, uh, near Tavistock. And um, yeah, that was amazing. Massive sea yeah. trout. And uh, it was a little bit uh, peaty, but you could, you know, go, go down. There. It was like, you know, just another world. It was in- incredible. So. A beautiful yeah it's like beautiful. swimming in tea isn't it without milk. it is um, yeah and, and so <laughs> for photography, well i guess from a photography point of view it adds a it's, it's odd but it adds a real atmosphere did you ever did you take any photos when you did it i, I did a little bit of video i mean I, it was very dark and i didn't take a torch or so i got so deep and i was yeah. like i could see fuck all <laughs> so it got a bit <laughs> bad but um yeah i i don't mind it i'm i'm not a traditional underwater photographer because most traditional underwater like it gin clear and no backscatter no bits in the water but i, I quite like that because it's how it is that's just what you get in rivers yeah, so yeah, it doesn't yeah. well, it tells you where you are when you see the color of the water it it, yeah. it, it, it locates you very well but, yeah uh, but you should come down again you should come down again we're going to do it having a, having a i've got some salmon pools that i use quite a lot they're a little bit i guess they are peaty but they're probably a little bit less peaty than the one that uh, that you're talking about but uh, but yeah. yeah when you when the uh, the sea trout are running and when the uh, the salmon are running all at the same time you can you can just hang there in the water with them and they just amazing fish to see them that close and especially when they're on the way up and they're not they're not battered and covered in um, what do you call it uh, salmon fungus or whatever yeah. you call it but yeah yeah yeah, yeah. no i'd like to i would like to do because i always end up going north as a salmon but i forget that you know devon and, and cornwall when I, when I used to live there there's a few good little salmon rivers there for sea trout and salmon so i should uh, yeah some nice places in the estuaries as well where you can see them sort of stacking up and again you've got holding pattern, pattern before the, uh, the river goes into spate so uh, yeah, some nice places, and it's quite. A, I mean, it's quite amazing just to be sort of swimming over these sort of sediments of the estuary, and then suddenly you you sort of you see something in in the murk in front of it. You think it's just a you know a tree trunk or something, and you realise it's just this solid mass of fish just sitting there waiting, just 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 holding their you know just conserving their energy, and, uh, and it's amazing how they do. It. In fact, there's been a study done, isn't there, recently where um, they've worked out that even if a salmonid, that's a you know a fish or a salmon is dead. If you place it in a stream in the right place, it's so hydrodynamic. It's not, it's not going to stick. Um, it's so hydrodynamic, it actually effectively still moves up or at least holds its place in the, uh, in the, in the flow of the water. So if, as long as you find the right, the sweet spot, like just behind a rock or something, it's so hydrodynamic, it literally can stick there. And, and Is that right? No, and the fish holds on. Yeah, so energetically, there's no... Um, is that the second thing I've taught you about freshwater fish? <laughs> I think it is. Yeah, I, I, obviously I don't know as much as I thought I did, so I might need to. Uh... Well, that's what that's all about. Is yeah. Brilliant. I think like, was it the other day? It was when was it? I think I was t- telling you about the uh, the singing of a of the bullhead. And, that was uh, in the Grant Arms, wasn't it? In uh, when right. when we saw each other in Scotland, yeah. Right. Yeah. Singing bullheads is another one, and that's that was um, that's another one of my favourite things. In fact, I heard it for the first time while snorkeling, thinking. What an, uh, I thought I had a you know you get bubbles in your snorkel and it makes a weird noise that echoes and you, you pick up the sound in your jawbone and then that transfers to and so it amplifies in your head in weird ways and, and you're thinking no that's that's different that's that's too regular for a bubble that's kind of making it it was a kind of a real kind of noise and you just and it, and it kept repeating and and it I didn't know what it was and and I I talked spoke to loads of people about this and I can't remember who told me. Someone said, so, so I was doing something, oh, it was probably, a, it was probably an ex-girlfriend of mine who um, was, you know, used to keep fish. She was a head aquarist at, at one of pretty zoos and uh, she really loved, you know, the sound of fish and she was telling me about, um, you know, how her fish used to vocalise. In fact, I used to have, I used to keep um, 
uh, Bershiers or Birchers or Bashirs. I don't know how you say it, B-I-C-H-I-R-S. They're the strange kind of living fossil type fish. They're uh, an African thing, also known as Congo eels. Um, and oh, okay, yeah. The fish tank. And they, they used to drum on their swim bladder and they'd make a really, a real grumbling noise. If I, if I turned the light on in the room, all you'd heard was this <laughs> coming from the tank in the corner of the room. We didn't like it very much. But well, it's funny you day. say that because we we did a podcast. It's not out yet, but it will be out by the time this one's out with a, a, a guy all about fish acoustics, Steve Simpson at the University of Exeter. And uh, oh, okay. he, he did some of the work on um, Blue Planet 2 recording reef fish and different vocalizations. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, because people don't think fish talk. So that, that's a kind of a, a plug for a podcast that I've already done, but it's not out now, but it will be out when this one's out. That makes sense. That makes okay, no well, sense. Well, I'm fascinated. I want to listen to that one. That's that's <laughs> right up my street. That's the same, exactly the sort of thing that makes me buzz. <laughs> mm. So I was reading up that you describe mm. yourself as a bio biophile, or you have biophilia, um, which sounds yeah. a little bit like an STI, but I'm sure it's not. So can you explain <laughs> what what that is? <laughs> well, it's not my word. It's no. um, it's a word that was coined by E.O. Wilson, I believe. It, it, I, I believe anyway. That's certainly where I came across it first. And it is that it's that natural affinity with living things, with the natural world. And another way of looking at it is you're just sensitive to life. Um, and quite a lot of, I mean, we're all biophiles when we're born. When you know you watch a child sitting in his pushchair, and if there's a fly on the ceiling or a spider running along the skirting board, it holds their attention. They're drawn to it in some way, and they want to poke it and touch it or put it in their mouth. You know, that's the same. I'm not saying I well, actually no, I do put a lot of wildlife in my mouth. But that's a completely different. Um, uh, that's, that's another area of, of sensory perception that I'm, I'm kind of into. But, Taste uh, nature. <laughs> gets me into all sorts of trouble, that one. But, um, but the point is, is yeah, when you're young, we're all into it. And then I guess the taboos of modern society and our disconnected selves kind of come into play. And that stuff's stamped out as being dirty or filthy. Don't do that. Ugh, fly, you know, all that sort of stuff. And as a consequence, we turn off. Or we're trained to turn off that uh, that um, that instinct, which which actually would have been, you know, we've all got it inside us, and I think we're all frustrated because we're not exercising it. It's it is our inner hunter gatherer. It's the part of us. You know, most of our existence as a species, we've been hunter gatherers. It's only in relatively recent times that we've settled down and and farmed and then built civilizations. Um, so for most of our evolution, we've been you know free ranging hunter gatherers, which means we've had to be in tune with nature in order to one know where the food's coming from and find our food, but also to avoid being food. So. I think being a naturalist, being a biophile, is simply just letting that part of our, um, our humanity uh, rise to the surface and, and, and have equal footing with the, with, with, with the modern bit. So yeah, that's, that's why I describe myself as a biophile, because it describes me, it's, it's, it's my obsession. I'm, I'm here in Tokyo, I'm in, in, in this you know, fairly urbanized environment, Yet the only way I can relate to it, I mean, you know, the culture is so alien to me. Um, you know, I don't, I, you know, I can't even, I went to use the washing machine downstairs last night and, um, you know, the, the guest laundry. And there's a washing machine. I know how to use a washing machine. I'm a ma modern man, but it's all in, it's all in symbols and, and a language I don't understand. So I'm just randomly stabbing at buttons. However, I walk outside. <laughs> And there's a bird, there's a bulbul in the tree singing, and there's a, you know, there's, a, there's an ant on the tree. And I already know something about that. It draws me in and it gives me a real sense of the underlying um, nature of the place, uh, literally the nature of the place. Um, and then from that, you can build on the culture. So I feel at home, it relaxes me. If I'm feeling stressed, wherever I am, you know, this isn't a natural habitat for me. I don't, I'm feeling quite, um, I feel out of place here because I am out of place, but I walk out into nature, and it calms me down, it's a salve, it soothes me. Um, it's certainly something that we've all experienced this year. Um, you know, when we were, you know, when we're locked down, of course, that green space, doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a garden, you know, whether it's a, a window box, a garden, uh, you know, a park, it doesn't matter what it is, suddenly we, we value it in a way that we perhaps didn't do so before. And, and that's all a biophile is doing, but he's just doing it all the time. And there's a lot of us out there. I mean, you're probably one as well. I bet, I bet you can't watch, walk past a river without going, no, oh, what's that? There? No, you, it's got to happen. You already start unravelling. Yeah, you, when, you already start unravelling it in your head, don't you? When, when I proposed to my, um, my girlfriend, we, we were walking over a river and it's when the grayling was spawning. 
And I thought, oh, I'll do it on the bridge. But the grayling was spawning. So I thought, oh, hang on a minute. And then I just started watching them for a couple of minutes. And then I thought, oh, I should probably get on with this. <laughs> so uh, grayling nearly knackered oh, up. Right. Right. There's a grayling, there's a grayling there's distributing his milks below us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've got to get your priorities straight in these, in these things, Nick, definitely. <laughs> I love I love a grayling. Uh, it's one of my favourite fish. Oh, they're my favourite. Male I grayling. Breeding condition is stunning. It's just a. It's, they are. It's like a peacock, isn't it? Yeah, stunning oil thing. oil painting. I always compare them to with the the different colours they've got in their uh, dorsal fin. They are they are gorgeous. Um, so you you've been a, a wildlife presenter for whew, over twenty years now, I guess. And I and I wondered. <laughs> sorry, sad face. Uh, I wondered yeah. if you thought presenting had changed much in that time for wildlife television. Um, well, I think the, the whole TV environment has changed a lot and how you present. Um, yeah. I, I'm very much, I feel a bit of a dinosaur nowadays, even though I, I, I'm not. I feel, I still feel the same, but um, the world is very, very different. It's been, it was never deliberate. Being a, being, you know, TV was just a career that I could pursue my interest in natural history within um, and it was a complete accident so it's been a lucky accident and I've managed to maintain it I mean I'm, I mean I'm out here it's given me some of the most amazing experiences of my life but it has you know it's a, it's a weird one because it does it does you know there is a um, a compromise you do miss out on other things you do you know family and friends uh, fall by the wayside quite a lot because the job does take over quite a lot and it's difficult because it's my passion so it's what makes me me or certainly the subject is um, so there are certain resentments that develop over time I've kind of I'm of a, a certain age and wisdom now I mean I started presenting I think my first piece was in 94 94 95 so I've been happy in front of a camera since then. And um, while it's not my, it's not every, it, it's not full time for me now. It was back in the day. I mean, I had several major series going on all at the same time at my peak and I was doing 27, 28 countries a year. Um, my carbon footprint is massive and not something <laughs> to be proud of, I have to say. You know, I'm still me. I still enjoy sharing it. If the medium changes, it, it changes. I think that when I started, it was a lot harder in the sense of you had to know someone in TV. So you had to bang on the uh, the door of the natural history unit. If it was wildlife you were into, you had to go up to survival, angle or whatever. And you just had to, you know, inveigle your way in, in any way you could. Now, when people ask me how to be a presenter, it's like, well... You can just do it. I mean, look what we're doing now. I mean, you can record programs. You can get OBS for your laptop and you can just sit there and record a program. Uh, if you care enough about something and passionate enough about it, there's a media, million different media platforms you can present it on. Now, I mean, it's good. There's also a lot of rubbish out there as well. So it's good to actually study, study the art of TV production a little bit, at least understand how to edit something or um, yeah, how to present properly, maybe. There's a few, there's loads of people doing courses. Again, I wouldn't spend any money on it if I was you, but um, there's a lot of free stuff out there. But, but just look at what you like to see. Look at the things that are important to you and are you feel are not being said, and then go ahead and say them. Now, how you turn it into money, well, that is another, that's a weird uh, and confusing, and something I haven't even grasped yet. I'm, I can talk for England, but um, I'm still not sure how to monetize it. I mean, you know, I can do podcasts, I can do all that stuff, but I don't really, maybe I just can't be bothered to monetize. It's like something, it just seems like such a, a hassle, and uh, I, I struggle with that. Maybe I can do it, something. I don't know, I just haven't really... Every time I think, every time things get desperate enough for me to go, right, I should probably look into this, um, a job comes along and I get distracted and off I go again. So, uh, which is fortunate. Um, and I guess it's one of those things. But as far as broadcast goes, it's changed and it's so different to uh, how it used to be. Yeah, I don't know what the answer is really. But no, yeah, it's definitely no, there changed. probably isn't really um, an answer. It's just, I was just curious on your your no, thoughts. I mean, it wasn't one thing. Really a question, was it? It's, not, <laughs> it's just an observation, really. Yeah. Well, one of the things I've noticed is there seems to be more programs, more natural history programs, where they just get some actor or some celebrity to narrate it. So they don't necessarily know anything about the subject. They're just presumably reading yeah. the script or whatever. And that seems to be a lot more popular than actually having someone who knows the subjects. But I guess, I don't know, I'm not a producer, so I don't know why the choice is behind that, whether it's to get the actors following or something like that to engage i'm not sure but that, i noticed the last few years you see a lot more programs where whoever actor is narrating uh, natural history programs 
it's a really difficult situation that obviously you can understand why because those actors come with an audience already so and it's a popularization you know there's the, the the cult of celebrity um that's the way it works but that thing that we used to watch tv we almost didn't care what color what what um um gender what creed the the presenter was or our age even it didn't really matter if they were ugly or whatever it was the passion that came from within and that was how it used to be and i missed that a little bit that um i there's not many people that i would say know their onions i mean i always think i use, use fred dibner as an example who you know i had no interest in steeple steeplejacks churches industrial architecture not interested not interested never cross not it's just about as far removed from me and and and, and what i'm interested in uh, as you can get yet fred dibner comes on as a presenter as a, 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 a basically a, a close to retirement steeple jack and i'm in i'm I, he's passionate and you know I'm, I'm passionate about anyone who's passionate about their thing it doesn't matter how weird or or outrageous or strange it is i am drawn in and that's what a good presenter should be to me um and this trend away from that has been a, is a bit weird and, and and somewhat disconcerting and also turns me off tv but you know if you give me a, a, a fred dibner um i'm in there yeah, definitely. I, I got asked to be in a book called Dull Men of Great Britain. And it was about oh. men. It was about, I know, it was about men who like bottle cap collectors or hedge enthusiasts, a guy who watched pylons. And I think because they thought all I did was look at fish, they thought, oh, this guy just looks through binoculars at fish. And they said, you know, would you like to appear in this book? And I, and I said, fuck off, basically. But in, hi <laughs> in hindsight, in hindsight, I should have done it for the crack, really. But like you say, these yeah. people are passionate about really obscure, weird things. I mean, it was, it wasn't, there was no money in it. So that's what put me off a little bit as well. But I should have done it for the yeah. fun of it. I should have done it just for the crack, you know. But it's funny what we get offered, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, again, it's those, you know, there's something, for someone to do that, I mean, obviously they could be complete loopies, which is another thing. But there, but there is also, <laughs> chances are, they're there's something driving that fascination and yeah. I'm curious. I want to get inside their head and work out what it is about this, you know? And that's sort of why I think that's why animal obsessives, I enjoy them so much because there's always something, there's always some sort of similar experience, some adventure they went on that, that set them off down this, uh, this road, which I guess is pretty much what your podcast is all about really, because you're just tapping into those, those yeah. moments really and see well, what, what turns people into the people they are today. Well, yeah, because there's no money in it, so I don't get paid to do this, and they're not monetized, there's no ads or anything, so I don't, I, I started it off during lockdown because it was like, well, I've got no work, and I'm going to drop, I'm going to go mad, so I did it as a way of keeping me busy, and to talk to people, because, you know, like you were saying, you know, it, it can get you down a little bit, and if you're not talking to people, so it was a great way, I mean, I started off talking to friends in the industry, and then I branched out to, you know, more personalities like yourself, so... I'm really enjoying it. It's not a, it's not getting in the way at the moment, so I'm going to carry it on as long as I can. But um, yeah, no, it's a great thing to to try and to try and do. I think yeah. anyway. So how many have you done now? Oh, well, well over fifty now by by the time of recording. So um, that's good going. Yeah, I'm a busy beaver. I mean, sometimes I'll do. It tends to be they come out every Tuesday, but I might. So for example, you know, it's uh, World Fish Migration Day uh, on tomorrow on Saturday. And if you know that, but it's World Fish Migration really? Day. So, um, so I've done a, a different podcast each day this week leading up to it with interviewing fishy people, basically, like, you know, from all over the place who work with fish migration. So sometimes I'll do little special weeks, but normally it's, it's one a week. So that's my mid podcast plug. But if you're already listening, if you're this far in, I feel like you're a safe bet that you're going to make it to the end, to be fair. Unless we go horribly yeah, wrong. Yeah, well, that's good. So, so is this just British fish? Or are you doing fish with no, the No, so I know I spoke to uh, someone from the Marcia Trust the other day. So I'd love to see, I've not done many fish abroad. And that's something that hopefully when um, I can get around a little bit more, I'd love to see a Marcia. I don't know if you, you have any experience with those in India or? thailand or anything like no, that no no not at all no and I, I, the, the, the one i was most fascinated with was the um, um the shad migrations on the east coast of uh, of america that was that's a big deal yeah um, and watching what, uh, from up the river we used to have them here historically we used to have shad in our in fact well as you know very incredibly rare fish now that yeah. occasionally i think one or two are seen but there's a few but, um, there, but not many yeah yeah, but it's a big deal. It used to be a big, just as, as big as salmon or trout um, at its 
at its peak. I mean, salmon and trout migrations now are pretty pathetic compared to what they would have been historically. But um, but uh, yeah, to, to see the shad migration and to see the frenzy that goes with it. All the, the fishermen out, they've got people pointing at rivers. You know, normal people getting excited and pointing at rivers is great. I mean, that's you know, we need to see more of that. And, uh, you do. Definitely. And yeah, it takes time to do it. But, uh, but yeah, it's a really, uh, it's a fascinating subject. So I'm going to listen. That's two podcasts now I've got to listen to. You there you yours. go. I know. You've got to catch up. 48 more to go. But <laughs> It's just an advert for the podcast. I is, yeah. <laughs> Although, like I say, we're nearly 40 minutes in. I feel like people are probably here, here for the end now, but we'll, we'll see. Um, that's two plugs. Let's see if we get a third one in. <laughs> that's it. We'll go. Fre- uh, freeze the charm, isn't it? O- over the years, you've worked on you know many TV series with many people, and uh, certainly w- one of the ones I remember you is on on the Really Wild show. So I just wondered how did how did that come about? That was really that was a bit of a. I mean, I, I, I started the whole process started when I was at university. I mean, I've always I've always presented. I've always shouted about my subject because my subject is so unpalatable to most people that when they go, Ugh, I can't stand that reaction. I react to it and I I pull them in and go, right, come here and say that. Look, look, I'll show you what it's like and I'll show you what I see. And then and if you still go, Ugh, then I guess I've tried. Um, so it started off doing. I was I did some local radio interviews because I set up a club for kids called the Bug Club. Um, which is now running with the Royal Entomological Society of London. But uh, no, back then it was RES, then it went to the Amateur Entomological Society. It's really boring details. But the point is, I set up the club that I would want it as a kid. Um, so I set it up with a, a lecturer of mine um, at university. That got the, the imagination of the press, which went into print locally um, when I was based in Exeter. And uh, that made the national press, because it was, it was a bit of a slow news day, I think, and it kind of made the national press. And then I got onto Blue Peter. So I brought the blue bug cover onto Blue Peter. So people got to see me that way. And simultaneously, I was working on a very rare butterfly on, on, on Dartmoor, which is the high brown fertility. And again, the scientists were doing this amazing work. I was part of a team that were working on this butterfly in the field. But no one was shouting about it. So I did it for them. Um, and of course, that made the press as well. And that made local radio, made Radio 4. Um, and I basically... It, lots of experience it came at different angles and one day um, a guy called Kelvin Boot who was the guy interviewing me said you should do this you're quite good at this stuff you know um, you know I had a sound bite um, hard to believe listen to me waffle on nowadays but um, I was good at the sound bite and um, and I wasn't what you'd expect to see as a naturalist back then I had a ponytail and earrings and wore all sorts of peculiar clothes so so they jumped at that um i was um given a little flyer that had gone around all the wildlife trusts which said do you want to be the next attenborough uh, we're looking for new presenters at the natural history unit which is obviously the legendary bbc um uh, center in bristol so i did a showreel with my girlfriend at the time it was a media student it was a terrible showreel and i sent it in um, um and i got invited to an audition uh and i got the job so that was a job on nature detectives um, and it happens that some of the production team on Notes of the Detectives were also the production team on The Really Wild Show. And it, my timing was just as Chris Packham was about to, you know, I think he had one more series to do and he was winding up and they were looking for someone to replace him. And, um, and I just happened to fall into those shoes at the right time. And I was completely naive to this whole thing. And I did a, about six months as a researcher at the BBC, which I didn't enjoy that much because I'm not really a townie. But again, I had nature to fall back on. I had the peregrines up at the Clifton Gorge and there was loads of great woodland and I'd just go out and scamper around outside of work. So it was all fine. And that's it. That's how it started. Um, so experience, you know, random experience in front of a camera and with a microphone, being told I was okay at it. Hadn't really thought about doing this before until that moment. I thought, well, I've got nothing else. It's either that or a life full of short-term conservation contracts, which nothing wrong with that, but there's not a lot of security in that. Mind you, there's not a lot of security in TV either, um, <laughs> especially at the moment. So um, I just went off down that path and, you know, I never, I'd never traveled. I'd never been on an airplane. I'd never seen outside of the UK. Um, so, you know, these, that was a ticket to adventure and I was off and I saw things in that first year working for the wild show. I saw things I would have just never dreamed of seeing and experiencing and, and it's very addictive and, uh, and I'm still doing it to this day. Really? I've got no plans and no idea how to build this career. I'm just doing, everyone goes, well, will you do this? Oh yeah, I'll do that. And off I go again. And it's like, there's no <laughs> career. It's just, I'm just bimbling along. I probably should start thinking about what I want to do when I grow up really, but it's, uh, I'm still enjoying it. And, um, for now, as long as I can just about scrape through and it's just about scraping through this year, um, I will carry on doing it, I guess. 
It's amazing how uh, incestuous wildlife TV is, isn't it? Like well, you'll get one person who works on one program and then they go to another one and that kind of carries you with them almost. So I've, I've found that anyway with the, with the filming side of things. And we, I was talking to yeah. um, uh, Lindsay McRae, who was the cameraman who did the penguins on uh, Dynasty. And he Lindsay was saying, well, yeah. you Bad, do know Lindsay. Boy, I know him as. That's the one. Yeah, and, Badger uh, Boy. That's it, yeah, Badger Boy. And he was saying that... Um, you know, to, to a degree, I mean, you've got to know your stuff, but it's also who, who you know. Like you say, like, you know, if you know the right person at the right time, it's, it's going to help, isn't it? If you know when to, when to pitch ideas or who to speak to yeah. about certain things. But it's a, it's a tricky industry, to, to say the least, as you, you and I certainly know. Yeah, and it's, it, it, it is who you know to an extent. But, it's, um, but what you mustn't do is assume that just because you're a presenter that you have all the answers and that, um, yeah, because people are always approaching me going, how do you become a presenter? How do I get into, I said, well, I'm, I'm struggling for work myself. So I'm the worst <laughs> person, you know, I'm not a success. So I'm the worst person to ask, what you want to do is get into the production side of things. Um, and, you know, you want, you want to be off camera, that's the place to do it. Cause then there's a, there's a clear career path. To be a presenter, you, you did a, and that's sort of it. You know, it's like, that's it. You get in front of a camera and that is it, you're there. And then it's then to do it again, to do it again is really difficult, and that sustaining it is difficult because, again, nowadays that celebrity culture means the moment you're the big thing, the, the new big thing, there's someone already looking for the next big thing, and it's a very short-lived um, existence. I mean, I'm, I've been lucky. I can't say why or how, but I've had my ups and downs. You know, um, you know, it's it's you know, you get times where you've got more requests than you can deal with and then you've got times when you're sitting there waiting for the phone to ring so you get on and write a book or you start gu doing guiding work or or do I, I went back to my roots I started working in on in in the field again doing field ecology in fact I've got a, I've got a fish job I've just applied for so uh, oh, good um, man. You know, <laughs> so yeah so who knows but yeah we're always out there we're always putting it around and just just you know just as long as I enjoy it I think that's the most important thing but uh, but yeah as a, a career in TV is a, a strange one you've got to enjoy it don't think it's going to make you rich and famous no more it no. might make you a little bit famous or infamous yeah but, infamous uh, more likely stuck in a, an airport hotel uh <laughs> like this this is it this is my entire habitat you can see it's in the frame now it's my entire <laughs> habitat for the uh, for the next two weeks and that skipping rope Yes, that's my exercise right there. <laughs> that's, all, that's all. That's all I've got to go on. So yeah, it's not quite as glamorous as people uh, people sometimes think. It has its moments though. So when you're not stuck in hotel rooms in in Japan, have you got a species that you would that you would love to see that you're not yet to see? Because obviously you you've been to lots of places, but there must be a species that you haven't seen yet, or that one that you'd love to see. Oh gosh, what in the UK or? Uh, no, no, and anywhere it can be anywhere. Oh, it's so difficult. I, <laughs> and also, I like to see things more than once as well. Um, yeah. I, I really, um, I, well, I still haven't seen a pink fairy armadillo. Um, and that's an animal that I've, uh, I've yeah. been very desperate to see. I'd love to see a giant, uh, weird enough, a giant Japanese or Chinese salamander. Unfortunately, I'm not going to yeah. see one on this trip, but uh, that's an yeah. animal. Which They'd be up there for me as well. I'd love to see one of those. Yeah, I've seen them in aquariums. I've seen yeah. the one there's an aquarium in Germany. I think I've seen them in. Yeah. Um, but I, I, yeah, that, that's an animal I'd love to see. But then there's, there's just loads of. I mean, uh, yeah, it's just loads of stuff out there. I mean, it says you know, there's a. I've scratched the surface really in the number of in the species out there that I'd like to see. I'd love to, in the UK. I want to see a shining guest ant. That's my. Um, All that's, right. I've never heard of that one. Yeah, the shining guest ant, and of course um, the uh, the new fox spider. Well, the fox spider has just been rediscovered on a Surrey heath, and that's another uh. one I want to see. So, uh, so yeah, there's loads of. So this is the thing. What I don't want to do is create this this illusion that all I want to do is travel the world and see things. I've been very lucky. No, I mean, yes. I don't do it without guilt. huge amounts of guilt because actually it's it's this sort of traveling that causes half the problems that the world's in at the moment. I mean, I know there's there's other bigger issues as well, but. But um, but you could take away my passport. Um, obviously, don't do it now because I'll never get home. Um, <laughs> but if I'm back in the UK and they take away my passport, then I am um, still be happy. You know, yeah. there's plenty of stuff to see. Uh, that we live in a fantastic cluster of islands, and uh, there's plenty I haven't seen or experienced. And there's loads of stuff I want to see again and again and again. You know, <laughs> there's so, a lot. Uh, yeah, there's a lot out there, isn't it? And I wonder, do you have any bugbears in? Because obviously, you've worked in wildlife filmmaking a hell of a lot. Is there anything in wildlife filmmaking that kind of ticks you off a little bit, or wish wish didn't happen? 
manipulation of the subject and the narrative. Um, I like real stuff. I like reality as it unfolds, as opposed yeah. to um, contrived reality. So someone said, right, here's some behavior that happens, and now we're going to put together a series of shots to show it. That is, I mean, I don't know if it's done as much as it used to be. I'll be honest with you, I don't watch as much natural history TV as I used to. No. Um, partly because I've been pretty close to it for too long, and I, I get a bit frustrated with it, and I often end up shouting at the screen. But um, it's, uh, which is a, an interesting picture of, of, a, of an angry man in his armchair <laughs> throwing, uh, throwing uh, the remote at the TV. But no, I kind of, um, yeah, I think that's probably one of my bugbears because I can, see, you can see when it's not, and, and that's yeah. the thing. For me, I like to see it happening for real in nature as nature intended. And don't get me wrong, I, I'm guilty. I mean, I've been involved with all sorts of um, um, setups and stuff over, over the years, but, uh, but the stuff I enjoy seeing as much is when it unfolds naturally and uh, and you see and also real people involved in real reactions. I love that blowing the cover of the TV technique. I love that behind the scenes stuff. I mean, I made a career out of doing it. You know, we, we, we ran such such cheap programs. We had such a small budget. We couldn't compete with the big blue chip, shiny blue chip programs. So when we did a TV show like Weird Creatures, pretty much everything we shot ended up on screen. So you saw the natural process. So if anyone in the audience had, was lucky enough to find themselves in my, uh, my shoes, um, you know, in the forest of Borneo, what you saw on screen and the, the, the frustrations that we had were pretty much what anyone would experience. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's the sort of TV I like because it, it's real and, it, and, and you feel it. And, um, and that's and, and it also it doesn't set you up for disappointment. I mean, how many of us have gone out there looking for that that Scottish otter, just like you know, just like Simon King shot on the on you know all that beautiful close up, see the droplets running running down its whiskers as it's chomping on a butterfish, sitting on a lovely bladder rat cov covered boulder in uh, in glorious sunlight. I've, Always, I've hardly ever seen it once, maybe. I've yeah. seen hundreds of otters, thousands of otters, and I've but they're usually not uh, beautifully lit, and they're but usually not that close. When it does happen, it's magical, of course. But but it doesn't make it any less magical when they're at a distance. It's just, of course, that's that's the illusion that's created, and it sets you up for disappointment. I'm, I I take people out and show them wildlife for part of my existence. And uh, I take them out there and I can't help but think that people are very disappointed with that golden eagle because it's like a little dot. I said, no, no, look, it's displaying. And then all they can see is like one pixel dropping out the sky and hitting another pixel. And, you know, that's, that's what it might as well be. And it's very difficult to get across the, 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 the glamour of that bird when it's at such a distance, but that's because that's what people expect him to see. That's the animal that's on the brochure, you know, that yeah. nice close up's on the brochure. So, so we're sort of guilty and people come running along thinking they're gonna see it up nice and close. And the reality is you're gonna see it and you're gonna see it for real, but it's gonna be a long way off. It's gonna be like that, yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I, I the, the, the kind of piece of footage that always I remember as a kid, I mean, God knows what program, it was some American one, it was a, a mouse in America that how, or apparently it howls. You, you might know the species. And yes, there's, yes, this, yes, yes. there's a really terrible shot of like a moon superimposed behind its head and it's howling in front of it. And then it fights a scorpion. Yes. And at the time I was like, oh, that's amazing. But looking back on it, I was like, that's almost certainly just done in a studio and they've just flung a scorpion and a mouse to have a punch up. So it's, um, you know, I know, I know it goes on. It's a, it's a shame to a degree, but it's, yeah. It's funny looking at it now because you kind of yeah, but there's, well, you remember it. I mean, yeah, I do remember, remember it. it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's done its job. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's true. Uh, I mean, so that's a sort of uncomfortable bit where you actually think, well, actually, I do remember that. I think I remember Life on Earth when it first came out. That's how old I am, and I remember sitting there, being allowed to stay up late to see it because obviously everything Attenborough said was was gospel, and uh, and my family would approve of educational television. So I'd sit down, and that was the one when the when he they found the coelacanth. This was back in the day where it was real. It was a real red letter day. You know, it's, we didn't know what we knew about coelacanths now, and they got this, dragged this fish up from the depths where it probably ruptured its swim bladder and all sorts of other things. And then they, they stuck it, um, they stuck it in shallow water and filmed it. So it was the first footage of a coelacanth, I believe in the wild. And, and, but they, they, they told the story like, look, we didn't, you know, this is not how it would be naturally, but it's the best we can do under the circumstances. And that I, it was contrived, but they told us it was. Yeah, um, there's no, there's no cloak and dagger as that. 
Um, and that sort of thing is fine. I think that oh, that sort of honesty. I mean, I don't mean sort of killing killing brilliant animals, but I mean they didn't do the killing. It had been caught by some fishermen, and they just tried to refloat it effectively. But but the point is, it was it felt real. It was proper adventure. It was proper discovery, opposed to you know contrived science. And I I I, I prefer to see that myself. It's a, I mean it's very personal, I guess, but that's yeah. my view on it. Yeah, no, no, I can see, I can see what you mean. So you, you've seen all kinds of creatures, great and small. Have you had any kind of close calls or any frightening encounters where you're like, oof? Well, I have, but it's, again, it's, it, that's close to being the, is there any animals that are you scared of or any animal? I'm not really, not really. No. Um, I've had moments of, um, you know, I've been very close to being bitten uh, by snakes that I should know better Um the, to handle uh, I think the first time I picked up a cotton mouth in America I was amazed that this because I don't Jim I mean I can snake wrangle I mean I breed I've bred snakes I don't have many I breed now but you know I've had lots of snakes over the years and I'm, I sort of know what I'm doing with snakes and I'd call, I've caught I've never kept hot snakes or venomous snakes and um, I caught this cotton mouth because yeah, how hard can it be just yeah. like any other snake why you know? not um, but what it did what it did was it kind of shape shifted. I didn't realize just how floppy their heads can become. And I had it, I had it in like the, you know, the classic sort of head grip and the whole thing sort of rearranged its skeletal muscles in its head. And, it, and then its fangs went boing, out the side of its mouth and it started trying to reach over, you know, over its neck to stab me. And it was just like, whoa. <laughs> so I had moments like that where, I mean, a very close and, you know, a very steep learning curve. I think the, you know, things like the worst, I'm not a massive fan of handling rodents is difficult. No, I mean, I've been nailed. I can pick up bugs absolutely fine, but mammals freak me yeah. out. Like, no. Yeah, they got teeth and brains, and they're the two things you don't want in close proximity to each other because they know what they're doing. And also, when you're dealing with rodents, they've got self-sharpening blades in their mouth. They're not like 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 us, where our teeth get blunt. These are, um, you know, they, they are, you know, they've, they've got hard dentine, uh, sorry, enamel on the front and dentine at the back, which is soft, which means that the back wears away quicker than the front, which means it's always got an edge. Um, and, um, and yeah, and so, you know, a squirrel, trying to get a squirrel out of a strawberry net or, um, I mean, the worst bites I've ever had um, have been a squirrel, um, in fact, two squirrels have bitten me uh, and required stitches and, a, and the school hamster that I looked after once, you know, they're, they're the worst <laughs> bites I've ever had, which aren't very glamorous, they're not glamorous, so con considering the number of exotic animals I've been in close proximity to, then they're, they're not the worst. I mean, I've been charged by rhinos and things like that. Um, they're, they're, th that's usually context that fills you with fear because you yeah. weren't expecting it. You know, that, when things make you jump. But if you go in and you're prepared, it's not really it's not really a scary thing um no. and situations you know i i remember getting stuck in a well looking for vampire bats in a costa rican railway tunnel that was disused only to find out when we we're halfway along it that actually there was a train coming things like God. that are where you know my life flashed before my eyes and i've amazingly got out of them usually it's not quite as bad as it seemed at the time but um but there's lots of things that that um yeah that, there's lots of fearful moments and i guess they are close calls but they're not the ones that necessarily are that exciting no no i know what you mean definitely uh not that i've had you know too many close calls i think the closest i've had a pike that got the, got the corner of my hand and i've got a, a bit of a scar for, it's, it's a pitiful scar it's a tiny one but that's about as close as i've got well, to, you know you know actually bitten by a pike I'm well people, oh, I was, they won't bite you you're fine <laughs> Well, I was releasing it, so it was one that an anger had caught. So it didn't it didn't bite me like out of aggression. You'd be very unfortunate for a pike to do that. You know, I've not had a pike yeah. a, a trout go for the jugular or, or an eel try to strangle me yet or anything like that. I've been, <laughs> been pretty good. As I say, we've talked about all these different species, all these different groups. Have you got a particular group of animals that you I know we've mentioned creepy crawlies, but that, that's a very broad term. Is there a specific kind of family or genus that you're like? They are absolutely incredible and they kind of utterly fascinate you. Oh, for variety. Oh, it's so, again, this is really difficult. <laughs> I love, I love the phasmids. I love stick insects. Oh, just okay. for that variation on the theme. You get them in Devon, I'm, don't you, as well? I'm quite, yeah, we do. We've got, we've got two or three species. We're really getting into my micro moths now. So yeah, there's lots of, yeah, it's really difficult to answer that question because it almost depends on what day it is as opposed to what animal I'm getting into. 
Yeah. Um, frogs. Oh, frogs. I'm really into it, especially in the tropics. I often go frogging. That's one of my favourite pastimes. When I'm, when <laughs> is that, I'm the, a, is that the technical frog, term, frogging? Often more frogging, and she seems to accept it, so that's good. Now, I, do, I just go off and look for frogs. I love the perfection of, of, of frogs. And um, and as a as a British kid, um, you know, we're somewhat limited in the number of species of frogs we've got in the UK. So you go to the tropics or anywhere that wasn't touched by the, uh, the last uh, glacial period, and um, you've got massive frog diversity. So salamanders are the same. So if I if I go to the um, mountain range that runs up the east coast, um, Appalachian Trail, for example, Appalachians up in the Ozarks. You know, that's the that's like, like the world diversity capital for for salamanders. You know, it's where if you want if you're into newts, go there for your holidays, and you'll okay. see more species of salamander than you'll ever see. So so these are all. I mean, again, as you gathered, I'm a, I'm a I'm a biophile. I'm a, I'm into multiple different groups. So I could. It just depends. This year, uh, this year I've been um, I've been working on my bees and wasps. You know, my solitary bees and wasps. Yeah. And I'm about to. I'm just about to write a book on on pond exploration, which you'll appreciate. Yeah. I'll be in touch because I've got some questions for you. But um, yeah, but, um, yeah I'm going to I'm doing a, I'm doing a write the the quintessential guide to, to pond exploring because there is nothing out there that really does no. the job. And, um, um, I want to, I want to show people the way into how you unravel a pond. And um, so I'm going to be doing that. So so then this year or next year is probably almost and they're going to be water beetles. Um, so it yeah. becomes, it's just, it's the way, I, you know, you just get into something and, uh, and, and we all do it. So some people do it with games, computer games, some people do it with Lego, you know, or, you know, whatever it is. So for me, it's, it's, it's various taxons of creatures and I, I, um, I enjoy it. And as we get to a certain age, I forget about it all pretty quick as well. So it all goes in, <laughs> I get used to it. And then the next year, someone goes, oh, you're a water beetle expert or you're really into your news. What's this? And you just go, Oh, that was last year. I can't remember. And you have to consult the diaries. And you always keep rigorous notes. So I think that's my that's my uh, my parting word of wisdom because your brain isn't always going to be quite as sharp as it is now. Um, so, so, so it's always good to have this you know library of notebooks you can call back on and uh, and remind yourself what it was that you had just seen or those little things, those little tricks that uh, that uh, that helped you out the first time round. Definitely. I mean, you mentioned wasps briefly there. I, I can't remember what program I was watching, but the, the parasitic wasps. And there's one that you get the wasps that get the caterpillars, but then you get parasitic wasps that parasitize parasitic wasps. And it's almost yes. like a never ending cycle. Yeah. Hyperparasitism is, yeah, it's, it's cool enough how a parasitic wasp selects a caterpillar. Yeah. Then you've got the wasps that select the caterpillars that have a wasp grub in them. So that's, you know, it's uh, um, a wasp inside a wasp inside a caterpillar. And then you get, so that's uh, uh, hyperparasitism. Then you get um, secondary hyperparasitism. So it's another wasp lays its egg in. And it, I think you can get quaternary parasitism. So it's four, four wasps inside one caterpillar. Well, and they're um, all different species or would they be the same? All different species, yeah. And that, I mean, that's the world we're living in. And we don't even begin to understand that because we don't pick up on the cues like that. You know, it'd be tiny, tiny particles of odor, um, you know, various cues and clues that they're picking up on. So, and that's, yeah, if you want your mind well and truly blown, get into insects, any insects will do. Wasps is a good start because uh, nobody loves wasps. And they, I often get that question, what's the point of wasps? And it's, that's a brilliant one. I roll my sleeves up and I yeah. get into it. The vein, the I, vein pops on your head and you're like, right. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's like one of those things, it's like, well, why does there have to be a point to anything? Um, uh, but I try and swallow that one and carry on and just go right. Okay, let's just take the solitary wasp because that's I'm assuming is what you're referring to, and then you just dis, you dismantle what a wasp is, what it is you're actually afraid of, because um, uh, ultimately it's based ignorance is based in some fear somewhere, and it's often the sting. Um, and when you explain what the sting, sting is, how it's used, and how expensive it is for a wasp to use it, you start feeling a bit more sorry for them. And then when you look at the the jobs they do for us, the recycling they do, the you know we like bees because they pollinate. Well, so do wasps. Um, we like ladybirds because they eat the aphids. Well, so do wasps. So you know there's plenty of reasons to get into wasps if you're just looking for, I guess, uh, ecological services. But when you start getting to the solitary wasps um, and then the parasitic wasps, your brain just explodes. It's a it's a steep rabbit hole to to get down to, but one that I'm sure is is fun for everyone to explore these creatures. Well, look, Nick, it's been great to talk to you, and I hope you enjoy the, uh, your Japanese adventure. 
I will. I'll be posting stuff on Instagram as I go. I don't know when this is due to go out. It may not be relevant, but uh, it'll um, be I'll at be the minute. Stuff. You're looking next year, I think. So, <laughs> so it'd be a while. I'll be back on it. We're all going to plan this. I get stuck in Japan. But uh, but yeah, so, you know, well, in that case, look back on my Instagram feed and you'll see the pictures of what I got up to. <laughs> in fact, you might even watch the program on the BBC. Yeah, so maybe. Know. It might even be on BBC Two. So, uh, <laughs> It could, anyway, yeah. it's been a pleasure, Jack. It's been lovely to chat to you. Always, you're one of uh, you're one of my favourite people in the sense of you're 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 one of the one of the good ones. You know, you're one of the the, the folk that uh, continues to inspires me. Um, and, um, and and I love the fact you're doing this podcast. And hopefully, you'll uh, you'll find you'll find even more fortune in this uh, in this world of broadcasting because uh, wow. you're one of the you're one of the special ones that is is one of those presenters that knows his onions and uh, and of course your fish book by the way i did the review of that for bbc wildlife magazine and i meant every word it is fantastic it's what's called the secret life of british freshwater fish i think it's called isn't it's it? uh hang on you don't even know do you <laughs> <laughs> the co- yeah of course i of course i do the complex lives of british freshwater fishing um you need a copy don't you yeah, have a word with the publishers because they I promised me. I've, I've, I've to review that from a PDF, which is very, very unsatisfactory. But, yeah, uh, I will the give them a nudge. It's absolutely brilliant. I know this is the third plug, by the way. This is it's not a plug. There we podcast, go. We've got it in. Book. We've got it in. It's all, <laughs> and, and it's no stick fancy here. It's genuinely an awesome book. It's a book that shows you fish like you've never before thought of seeing fish. It's the book that is should have been written a long time ago. Yeah, good man. I'll, I'll I'll send you that five quid down for that for that plug. Um, yeah. Look, buddy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, take... is it more? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe maybe. Send me the book, Jack. I'll be happy with that. Okay. Although we'll take care, Nick, and uh, we'll see each other soon. I'm sure. Will do. Nice one, Jack. We'll catch up with you soon. That was Nick Baker. Great to chat to him. I think one of the things that shines through is his passion for a wide array of subjects, but also his knowledge. He knows. He's a fountain of knowledge. He knows so much about more or less everything that he's talking about. So that is absolutely great. And I can't wait to watch that series uh, that's going to be on. I don't know the name of it, but keep your eyes peeled. I'm sure Nick will be publicising it on his Instagram and Twitter when that comes out. Now, the next few podcasts are going to have a bit of a theme, and that's going to be an angling theme, largely because I'm working on my biggest project ever, which is Britain's Hidden Fishers. And it's a crowdfunding campaign to make an hour long film on Britain's marine and freshwater fish because they just don't get the love that they deserve. So it's not an angling film, but obviously anglers will be interested in it. So for the next four or five podcasts, I'm gonna be interviewing people working in angling TV, kind of well-known uh, superstars, if you like, about their experiences. Everything from Hugh Miles, who's gonna be on next week, For those of you who don't know, he's an amazing wildlife filmmaker. He filmed a lot of the Attenborough series, but he also made Passion for Angling, which is largely regarded as the best angling series ever made. But Matt Hayes, John Bailey, uh, and many, many more interesting people over the next few weeks, and giving you weekly updates on what is happening with the crowd funder. So keep your eyes peeled from that. Hopefully you've enjoyed today's podcast. This has been the Bearded Tits Podcast. I've been your host, Jack Perks. And I will see you next time. Cheers.